Hello and welcome to another episode of the Christian Reeve podcast. This is part two of our introduction to UFOs and aliens. I'm super stoked to be doing this topic with Josh. Make sure you go check out his show, Pursuit of Infinity Podcast. And if you'd like to support everything that I do, please consider subscribing to us on YouTube, putting us a review on Podchaser or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listened to this show. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so on patreon.com slash Christian Reeve and get yourself exclusive access to bonus podcast content, other bonus content from elsewhere, and of course, the Life with Christian Reeve show, which is a Patreon exclusive show. This month, we covered paranormal experiences, all part of the spooky season. Now, without further ado, please enjoy the rest of the show. Moving it forward. Area 51. In the 1950s and 60s, multiple UFO sightings were reported around Area 51 in Nevada, a site used vicariously by the CIA, US Air Force, and Lockheed Martin, don't know what that is, to test flights of experimental aircraft or black aircraft. Declassified documents show Area 51 was home to a Cold War program called Oxcart, de dedicated to creating a spy plane that would be undetectable in the air and could be used to gather information behind the Iron Curtain. The resulting SR-71 Blackbird, F-117 Nighthawk, and Archangel 12 A-12 travelled at speeds upwards of 2,000 miles an hour. These mysterious planes helped fuel rumours that Area 51 was used to conduct experiments on extraterrestrial life and their sp spacecraft. Now, a couple of things about Area 51 is that, obviously... I, th I assume everyone knows this, but let's just delve into this. You can't get anywhere near Area 51. If you do, the government, sorry, not the government, the Air, Air Force, the military will shoot you down. Like, you know, it's trespassing. They will arrest you. You know, there's people who try to do, just just drive even close-ish to it and they get followed by cars all the time. Even people just doing like very straightforward documentaries where they're maybe they're not even filming anywhere near. They're just trying to do like some desert shit and they get like followed and it's really, really creepy. Um, and, you know, I mean, look, any place that is not on Google Maps that like you can't find it and, you know, you're actively told you can't go anywhere towards and you're actively told that, you know, there's nothing to worry about here. It's just classified government staff you know like nothing to tell you da, 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 da. like it, obviously that's gonna provoke people to think that maybe there's something going on they keep telling us nothing's going on maybe something's going on but bringing it to our conversation what do you think the likelihood is that they've actually conducted experiments on extraterrestrial life or that this indeed is a hub for extraterrestrial activity in some shape or form i think it's very very possible that at one point in time they did the research there on whatever they have in their possession but it seems likely to me that anything that as that is of very high importance has been moved elsewhere mm. because it is just such common knowledge everyone associates aliens and ufos with area 51 even to the point that the surrounding like cities and towns there they have like um they have hotels and stuff i think I'll there's one that's that. called the, li the that. little alien <laughs> yeah like i mean they're just straight up advertising you know uh, aliens and ufo's around the area so to me it seems like um they're probably moved there are these things called dumbs have you heard of them d u m b s mm -hmm. Or D U M B would be the the acronym. Um, Deep underground military base is what it stands for. I love that. Um, Dumb. And it, yeah, right. It's awesome. <laughs> I was I was I was thinking that you you pulling my leg. No, he's being serious. Dumb dumb. This is kind of like uh, if you ever seen Stranger Things. Uh, yep. There's this one scene I think in the most recent season where they're like in a desert and there's just a door in the middle of the desert and they open the door and it leads to you know. a a staircase that goes downstairs underground in the desert somewhere massive military base so you don't really have 
this big giant building or apparatus where it's obvious that there's a military base there. There's just like a random door in the desert leading Spe to an underground base. Speaking of um, Stranger Things, I, I, I heard somewhere that that show is loosely based on a true story. As I in, wouldn't be surprised. Like not, I mean, I know everyone's going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about, Christian? Again, but this idea that there was a small town somewhere in the States that had some sort of similar issue where the government kind of quarantined this specific town and there was a bunch of stuff that to this day they're not able to talk about or whatever that happened in this town and everyone was swore to secrecy or whatever um and you know obviously the conspiracy theorist in me looked at that and just thought like what well, damn like there's how often does this happen and we have like no idea that this happens you know not to mention the potential of harnessing like the human psychic ability as they have you know shown in that show i think uh a lot of people claim that there is some truth to that as well. Mm, yeah, no, uh, yeah, obviously, again, this could be another show, but that idea that um, I suppose the, the idea of like different worlds and stuff, different dimensions is, is, is really interesting or like a link to get to another part of the world in a different form in a quicker fashion. I found quite interesting. I think it's very yeah, the whole concept, the, the concept of like the upside down, you know, yeah. a world that's right in front of your face at all times but it's just you switch the frequency of consciousness or something like that, and then you're able to like access this other realm. Very interesting. This idea of frequencies as well, fascinating. I mean, obviously in in ghost in the ghostly world, there's this idea that there's specific frequencies that if you tune into them, you can hear the dead, so to speak, or hear echoes of the dead. I don't know, but again, that's a show for another time. I found this amazing. Right. So President Carter in his presidential campaign. So he wasn't president at this time. He said this or he was questioned on this and he admitted to this freely and he offered this information up. And I found this ballsy because back then to turn around and say that you'd seen a UFO as just a member of the public would make you the, the you know, point of scrutiny. But in a presidential campaign, that's ballsy. And he became president thereafter. He said, I am convinced UFOs exist because I have seen one. If I become president, I'll make every piece of information this country has about UFO sightings available to the public and the scientists. The president saw his UFO at night in 1973 in Thomaston. Uh, I believe that's Georgia after speaking to the lions club there. <laughs> I love this, like how language changes. It was the darndest thing I'd ever seen, he said. It was big, <laughs> very big. It changed colors, and it was about the size of the moon. We watched it for 10 minutes, but none of us could figure out what it was. One thing's for sure. I'll never make fun of people who say they've seen un unidentified objects in the sky. Fuck for Carter. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yo, I love the accent. Very, very good English accent. Oh, American shit. accent. <laughs> I've been working, just on the side, I've been working hard on, on accents. Um american ones i think i've hit like a new a new stride or a new a new phase in my voice acting career um so we're slowly getting there slowly. i can see that in like your instagram posts and stuff i i see that your accents are getting really good your voiceovers are getting awesome too oh thank you man i appreciate that brother let's move it forward other investigations of ufos now with this show there was different ways that i was going to approach this but i wanted to kind of go purely based on facts and, and what I could find from an official capacity. And uh, yeah, I found a lot of interesting stuff. Like, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, tip of the iceberg. So despite the failure of the ETH to make headway with the expert committees, a few scientists and engineers, most notably J. Allen Hynek, an astronomer at Northwestern University in Evanston, who had been involved with projects Sign, Grudge and Blue Book, concluded that a small fraction of the most reliable UFO reports gave definite indication sorry, for the presence of extraterrestrial visitors. Hynek founded the Center for UFO Studies, or KUFOS, which continues to investigate the phenomenon. I went on this website and, oh my God, like, guys, when you've got five minutes, go on to www.kufos.org and you will find 
perhaps the most extensive covering of like UFO history, uh, phenomena, sightings, like everything you could ever possibly need. And like a lot of the old classic data as well is like legit, just like old news clippings from that time. So you got like clippings from like the 30s, 40s of all the information there scientific studies the latest information like it's it's really worth checking out and it's like one of probably thousands of different organizations around the world doing this so really really incredible stuff aside from project blue book the only other official and fairly complete rounds of ufo sightings were kept in canada where they were transferred in 1968 from the canadian De department of national defense to the canadian national research council the Canadian records comprised about 750 sightings. Less complete records have been maintained in the United Kingdom, Sweden, Denmark, Australia, and Greece. And I will be covering a lot of those sightings from a particular nation in the next show. In the United States, KUFOS and the Mutual UFO Network in Bellevue, Colombia, continue to log sightings reported by the public. In the Soviet Union, Sightings of UFOs were often prompted by tests of secret military rockets in order to obscure the true nature of the tests. The government sometimes encourages, encouraged the public's belief that the rockets might be extraterrestrial craft, but eventually decided that the descriptions themselves might give away too much information. UFO sightings in China have similarly been provoked by military activity that is unknown to the public. So this, I touched on this earlier, but this idea of like emitting that it's real when it suits them and dismissing it when it suits them. Very common theme with the government. <laughs> um, imagine that. They just lie when they need to lie, tell the truth when they need to tell the truth. Anyway. So I, 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 I always, with my notes, I always kind of structure it into like sections. I try to have, be like very organized with this stuff. So this section is possible explanations for UFO sightings and alien abductions. So UFO reports have varied widely in reliability, as judged by the number of witnesses, whether the witnesses were independent of each other, the observing conditions. So it's quite interesting, like the fog, haze type of illumination. So obviously you could dismiss a lot of stuff based on that. And also the direction of the sighting. Typically, witnesses who take the trouble to report a sighting consider the object to be of extraterrestrial origin or possibly a military craft, but certainly under intelligent control. This inference is usually based on what it is perceived as formation flying by sets of objects, unnatural, often sudden motions, the lack of sound, changes in brightness or color and strange shapes. Now, Josh mentioned all of this earlier. Again, we'll explore this in greater detail in, in the next show that we do together. One thing, though, that I want to kind of comment on here, I think one of the biggest reasons maybe why we've not seen as many sightings or maybe they're not taking this seriously anymore and you mentioned it earlier, is this idea that drones exist now. Things could so easily be just, oh, it's a drone. Oh, it's a bigger drone. That's, and, and the general public can own them now as well. So I, th I think, you know, any legitimate sightings might unfortunately be dismissed these days, but move it on. The unaided eye plays tricks. That's also a well-known... Uh, <laughs> I imagine being gaslit as well. It's being told like, oh, no, your eyes deceive you. And it's like, I know what I saw. Like, are you telling me I, my, my eyes are lying to me? Who knows? A bright light, such as the planet Venus, often appears to move. Astronomical objects can also be disconcerting to drivers as they seem to follow the car. I think we could probably actually dismiss this and say that, you know, if you're getting tired and you're driving and you're seeing a lot of lights, There's you, you might be seeing things. Or maybe you're not, I don't know. But that's that could be what that is. Visual impressions of distance and speed of UFOs are also highly unreliable because they are based on an assumed size and often made against a blank sky with no background object, e.g. clouds, mounting, etc., to set a maximum distance. Reflections from windows and eyeglasses produce superimposed views. I'm just thinking of, like, Jurassic Park now. <laughs> Come complex optical systems such as camera lenses can turn point of point sources of light into apparently saucer shaped phenomena. I will agree there's some some truth in this as well that like sometimes something can appear to be something else based on the lighting and stuff. Like I've seen that in action. I'm sure you have as well, Josh. It's yeah, sometimes truly 
what we see is is not true because it, it's like looks different in a certain angle and such such optical illusions and the psychological desire to interpret images are known to account for many visual ufo reports and at least some sightings are known to be hoaxes this also ties into what i was saying earlier about this idea that you know you can be so desperate to prove that something is something that you were trying to see something that simply isn't there. And I feel for these people because maybe they truly did see something one time, but now that they've only seen it one time, they're trying to look for it everywhere. And we know as human beings, like I read this the other day, completely unrelated to what we're talking about, but this idea, there's a specific phenomenon where we see faces and everything. There's like a, I can't remember what the term is, is but it's like a, um, a concept, a thing that exists. And and it's true. We do see faces in things. Well, we try to see them in things. And sometimes it's intentional. Other times it's just our brains trying to see recognizable patterns, I suppose. Things that, you know, we can rely on. Things that make sense to us in some shape or form. Reflections from windows. Oh, I thought I've already covered this. Sorry. We'll move on. Such optical illusions in this. I oh, already covered that. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just like, this is, this is embarrassing after three and a half years of this. Radar sightings, while in certain respects are more reliable, fail to discriminate between artificial objects and meteor trails. Ionized gas, rain, or thermal discontinuities in the atmosphere. So I think this is kind of maybe exploring the idea that, you know, when you do see phenomena in the sky, like, for instance, aur aurally, I can't even say it, aurora borealis, aurora borealis, or there northern lights, northern lights. Uh, you could argue that like, I'm sure when people first saw that, they thought it was something out of this world. And actually, it's just a common phenomenon. Contact events such as abductions are often associated with UFOs because they are ascribed to extraterrestrial visitors. However, the credibility of the ETH as an explanation for abductions is disputed by most psychologists who have investigated this phenomenon. They suggest that a common experience known as sleep paralysis may be the culprit as this causes sleepers to experience a temporary immobility and a belief that they're being watched now. I have sleep paralysis. I did a podcast on it one time because I have dealt with this all my life. This particular comment pisses me off because it's basically the government and the scientists going, no, 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 no. What you saw is just sleep paralysis. It's nothing. Now, we do have these ideas of like the night hag. I've actually experienced that one time. I'm of the opinion, though, normally I'd be like, well into the idea of of like the paranormal and stuff but in this specific instance i think it was just me not being comfortable where i was sleeping you know you 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 have vivid dreams for example when you've been drinking or you know i had a lot of sleep you know your mind kind of pardon my language fucks with you a little bit and that's the only incidence of a paranormal event in the context of sleep paralysis i've ever experienced every other time is the same old thing. I think I spoke with you about this, Josh, at least once. But uh, it basically, just watching myself trying to wake up. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if it's an out-of-body experience or if it's like me half awake, not really know what's going on. Um, but I'm normally sort of somewhat consciously aware. Uh, but basically what I've read into with regards to UFOs and aliens is they try to dismiss a lot of alien abduction stories as being just sleep paralysis stories and people trying to find make it well, basically people making up bullshit, making up shit. Um, you know, though we also ignore uh, the potential for us to interact with and see things in a way that isn't just face to face me physical and something else physical, you know, and again, you know, I bring it up all the time because it's one of my most uh, um, sought after experiences that has led me to these types of beliefs. But psychedelics, if you take a psychedelic, you will experience something that is more real than real. And it's not physical right in front of you. It These types of experiences allow you to sort of accept the fact that there are experiences that exist uh, only within the mind. Um, and 
actually, interestingly, there was a declassified U.S. government document that has said one of the more intriguing aspects of the UFO UAP that they see is that they have, quote, the ability to alter human consciousness. So that fact right there tells me, or that observation tells me that there's a potential here for an experience to be controlled by whatever this non-human intelligence is. Maybe it has a deeper understanding of what it means to be conscious, what it means to have a mind. And as you know, you sort of laid out in uh, in what you were saying about you know, seeing glares and stuff like that, like the human senses are not that accurate. Um, you talked to Jay Nelson about consciousness, mm -hmm. and I'm sure he brought this up to you, that the the way that we interact with things in our world, the way that we sort of create consciousness, it's not very, act it's not very accurate. The way we see, the way we hear, all of our senses, they're more creating it's more of a co-creation than it is a direct representation of what reality is so who knows how that could potentially be altered you just take a drug and you're in a different reality so imagine if something has the ability to interface with with your consciousness and change it in some way i mean the possibilities are endless maybe the abductions do happen within the mind maybe you're consciously having the experience as opposed to your body actually being taken away. And that's interesting as well, because firstly, that's not really something I'd considered in this particular conversation is this idea that they could almost like mind meld with you, like access your consciousness, as you say, remotely from far away. But it also kind of directly combats with classic alien abduction stories where the person is physically abducted. But then that begs other questions, like maybe some aliens are capable of doing that and others aren't. Or maybe over time they learn how to do that. Or maybe it's a different type. Maybe they, they can do more if it's physical versus remote. You know, there's so many questions. I love it. As, as shows like this are great because like you come into it thinking like maybe we can make some leeway and of course you're not going to make any leeway you're just going to end up with more questions but i don't know i'll never stop <laughs> you can't stop me no. i love it i found this randomly and i wonder what you think of this italian dictator mussolini allegedly covered up a ufo crash in the 1930s italian ufologist roberto pinotti claims to have proof that supports the allegations that a UFO crashed in Italy in 1933. So to put that historically into context, that's uh, we're talking like six years before the start of the World War. I believe Hitler would have been chancellor at this point, or at least in government in a major way. Uh, we were very, put it like this: the, the events that would lead us to World War II were very much in motion at this point, and and um, I suppose politically speaking, we were very much headed towards that. And allegedly, yeah, it was covered up by Italian dictator Mussolini and the government at the time. Now, this particular ufologist has stated that he has documents confirming the cover-up, as well as having had several people come forward to him and announce their involvement in the program. Moreover, the cover-up reportedly involved Mussolini transporting the UFO to the US. Now, two things here that I found interesting. One, it mentioned it sort of connects with what you were talking about earlier about this idea of several people being involved in a project and coming forward in some way or confirming uh, an existing story uh, to give it more legitimacy and also just this final bit like <sighs> they would have had a very tumultuous relationship at this point you know it, they wouldn't have been on good terms the states and italy so why on earth would they consider transporting the UFO? I mean, I suppose maybe if it was known that at that time the US had some sort of intelligence over that or, or some noteworthy systems for research on that. But then here's the thing. In our timeline that we've broken down here, the US only really became started to become an authority on this in the 40s onwards. But as we've outlined in this conversation, UFOs have been seen or allegedly seen for thousands of years. 
So how long have we really been investigating UFOs? Maybe we've always been investigating UFOs in some shape or form. Maybe it was called something else prior to that. Yeah, and again, if we're looking at levels of government, um, you know, if you just look at the Ukraine war right now, you know, there's the presented facts that the governments of each of these sides want you to know. And then there are the deeper levels of government where, you know, U.S. is fighting a proxy war versus Russia, trying to destabilize their military. Like there are so many deeper, deeper levels. Um, and it seems to me that at the deepest level of government involving the UFOs, UAPs, this is like how we were saying earlier, like the the black government, that that part of it. I think that part has probably existed for a while. Probably if Mussolini did transport those UFOs or whatever it was to the United States, it seems to me that the U.S. probably had a, a, a firm grasp on this even back then. And every time you hear of... Um, you know, a, a crash or a sighting or any of that stuff, the U.S. is always the first ones on the scene. Uh, in Brazil, there was uh, a crash that has, uh, that's been gaining a lot of popularity recently. And I think the place, it was called Virginia, um, is in Brazil. The U.S. government was on that right away in an instant they're always right on every single crash every single encounter there was another uh encounter that was supposedly a crash in africa there was a school of a bunch of kids that saw um quote unquote aliens come out of the craft and they actually had telepathic communication with them there's a really interesting documentary on this there's actually a few documentaries on this case and again, right away, the, the U.S. government is always the first one there. I feel like the U.S. government has, there's, there are agreements between countries involving the UFOs, um, but I think the United States is at the head of that. Whenever you talk about that as well, I can't help but, f <laughs> it's like the classic U.S. are the bad guys in the movies kind of concept. Like specifically, because I've noticed this as well, in any kind of, ufo sci-fi related film the government the u.s government specifically is always the bad guys they're always trying to cover shit up trying to lie to the people etc right and obviously we know the reason why that is but just looking at it in general i mean assuming that they are the authority on things they would want to kind of keep that under wraps as much as possible and control the narrative but it must be so difficult trying to control that around the world, everywhere. And of course, having agreements with those countries is a big part of that. But then now everyone has like, you know, cell phones, everyone has the ability to record stuff. And then it becomes about trying to control the information online. But once it's online, it's it's there forever. You know, very difficult to it's scrub the harder. internet. Mm. It's getting harder for them. Yeah, for sure. But also... And this is to bring up a point that you said earlier that if they came out and told us that aliens exist now, people would freak out. I'm but they kind of so did, sure. though. They kind of did. I'm not, I'm not so sure because, yeah, they did. They did tell us, essentially. Like, they had these congressional hearings that said, you know, the dude said, like, this is real. This is here. Our government is involved in this. And, like, nobody gave a shit. That's people what I don't understand. So, they, they basically, so they basically attached to their phones and... That, that's what blew my mind as well, just because to, to, I, so I covered this earlier, but if I remember correctly, the quote that they said, okay, because I said that they pretty much said like, oh, aliens exist. They didn't say it in so many words. What they said was these things that we found are not human. That's pretty much exactly what they said. And the internet ran with, oh my God, aliens are real. What the fuck? Like, what is this year? But as you said, most people just kind of didn't really give a shit, like, which blows my mind because it's like, that's the biggest revelation that could possibly ever be, really, other than, I don't know, God declaring existence and being like, I am alive, here I am, I am God. Like, that, that's the only other thing I could really equate to being equal in like, oh my God, mind fuck, you know. Uh, but even that, like, it, someone could come out and say they're God and we would still be like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I feel like it's the same with aliens. It's like an alien could come down tomorrow and we'd be like, oh, I don't know fake news maybe it's doctored maybe it's this maybe it's that 
Like I saw something the oh, other day, right. and I I don't know if it was a joke or not, but there was something in like Mexico where it was like two guys at some sort of weird press conference, and they had what looked like aliens in the back, and they looked like ET aliens and everyone on the internet was just joking that they look like et and they're like what the fuck is this is this is like the worst attempt at trying to convince us that this is real ever and i don't know because again they were talking in mexican i don't know what they were saying but uh did you hear about that story did you see that story i did yes and i, I saw some conflicting analyses of it um one of the more interesting things that i saw was uh so they were they're whatever they are they're real mummified bodies now I I saw that when they looked at the bones, like the structure of the bones, they were finding bones of different types of animals just sort of m like mashed in there and then mummified. But mm, they did actually find these mummified things. So it almost seems to me that like it's pretty possible that some ancient people were messing around with other animals and trying to recreate something and like mummified. Well, like a builder you know, bear uh, of <laughs> fucking yeah, <laughs> <but> like animals. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Jesus. something like that. But the, it's it's basically been saying that they're non-human, but if they're animals, they're also non-human. So mad. Even even our ancestors were like a bit fucked up, really. Like with their sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mentioned before about alien abductions. Uh, so I've got a whole kind of section on this. And this kind of came out, like, I was going to explore this anyway in the episode, but one of the questions I received from our wonderful Vilma, thank you so much for your enthusiasm, for caring, for being in, in just so invested in this. Thank you, Vilma. Hi, Vilma. Woo! She said, one of the questions she asked was, what was the scientific community's perspective on UFOs? Now, we've kind of explored a lot about the sort of things they say and how they dismiss a lot of things. But when it comes to alien abductions, they pretty much completely just dismiss it all as sleep paralysis. And this comes from a lot of different studies that I've read. So I'll read out some of these and, and I've found some interesting information for a lot of this as well, that we'll sort of go into as it comes up. In response to a new psychological study of persons, this comes from David V Forrest in 2008. So it was, studies being conducted back then a study of persons who believe they've been abducted by space aliens that found that sleep paralysis a history of being hypnotized and preoccupation with the paranormal and extraterrestrial were predisposing experiences i noted this is him talking that many of the frequently reported particulars of the abduction experience bear more than a passing resemblance to medical surgical procedures and propose that experience with these may also be contributory. Co contributory. I can't, sp I can't speak. This is the altered state of consciousness. Uniformly colored figures with prominent eyes in a high tech room with a <laughs> round, bright saucer like object. There is nakedness pain and a loss of control while the body's boundaries are being probed and yet the figures are thought benevolent i don't know how that okay no medical surgical history was apparently taken in the above mentioned study but psychological laboratory work evaluated false memory formation if physicians are causing this syndrome in a per percentage of patients we should know about it and persons who feel they have been abducted should be informed should be encouraged to inform their surgeons and anethologists without challenging their beliefs. So it's like saying that like, okay, these people were working on these people and then they were, I guess, tripping out. And now we've got to kind of, you know, challenge these people and be like, no, 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 no. Like all these things you're experiencing, like it's nonsense. Like it means that you, you just are respecting, responding badly to, to the surgery. That's, that's the problem. Well, this is like a near-death experience too. Like, I know. who's to say that an altered state of consciousness is not "quote unquote" real? Because what we experience right now is a hallucination. You know, the, our realities are just an amalgamation of brain chemistry and senses that co-create the reality that we perceive. So, who's to say that an altered state of consciousness is more or less accurate than what we're actually seeing? So. I think we have to contend with the paradox of what it means to be in an altered state. Previous experience, sorry, previous research has shown that people reporting contact with aliens known as experiencers, 
great term, appear to have a different psychological profile compared to control participants. They show higher levels of disassociative dis disassociativity, absorption, paranormal belief and experience, and possibly fantasy proneness. <laughs> prone to fantasy. It's prone to Lord of the Rings marathons. No. They also appear to show greater susceptibility to false memories. Experiences were found to show higher levels of... Or, what, have I copied the same thing twice? Wow, I'm such an idiot. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I've done that. I go back in my notes. I'm like, wow, I must have written these particular ones at 2 a.m. Mark H. says he was abducted by aliens. He clearly remembers awakening one night, unable to move anything but his eyes. He saw flashing lights, heard buzzing sounds, experienced feelings of levitation, and felt electric, tingling sensations. Most terrifying were the non-human figures he saw by his bed. Mark believes they were aliens. Later, he underwent hypnosis to try to recall exactly what had happened to him under hypnosis. Mark remembered being whisked through an open window to a large spaceship. He was very frightened when aliens took him into some, some kind of medical examining room. There, he had sex with one of them. Afterwards, the aliens brought him back to Earth and returned him to his bed. Mark describes the experience as terrifying. But did it really happen? <laughs> Sorry, the way they, they the, the way they put that, I got this from, um, I believe, yeah, from a news article from Harvard. I just, I just love that. Did it really happen? Or was Mark just really trashed on a night out? No. Uh, some researchers at Harvard University devised an experiment to determine if memories of abduction by space aliens would provoke the same physiological reactions that occur when other people, such as combat veterans and those who survive deadly car accidents, recall their traumatic experiences. Richard McNally, a professor of psychology, and his colleagues recruited six women and four men who claimed they'd been spirited away by extraterrestrials, some of them more than once. Under hypnosis, seven of the ten reported having had their sperm or eggs extracted for breeding purposes or experiencing direct sexual contact with the space aliens. Each of these people were interviewed by Eva McNally or Susan Clancy, also a professor of psychology. Each also wrote a script that told the story of his or her abduction. The research team then made audio tapes spoken in a neutral voice from the scripts. The abductees listened to these tapes in the laboratory of Scott Orr at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Manchester. Uh, I'm going to guess this is New Haven as the tapes played. The researchers record their emotional responses using such measures as heart rate and sweat on the palms of their hands. Is it possible it could just be like sex dreams? I don't know. <laughs> the, same, the same procedure was done with eight people haunted by traumatic experiences unrelated to abduction by aliens. When the two sets of measures were compared, the results were striking. Abductees showed surprisingly strong physiological reactions to the tapes of their alien encounters. Their reactions were as great or greater than those of the individuals who cannot shake memories of combat, sexual abuse, and other punishing events. McNally announced these findings on February 16th at a meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Denver. The results underscore the power of emotional belief, he noted. People who sincerely believe they have been abducted by aliens show patterns of emotional and physiological response to these memories that are strikingly similar to those who have been genuinely traumatized by combat or similar events. Neither McNally nor the other Harvard researchers ever considered the possibility that people in the study or anybody else was ever abducted by space aliens. But if not, what produced their lasting vivid memories? The researchers tie such abduction stories to a phenomenon they call dreaming with your eyes open. The episodes occur just as people awaken from a dream. Dreams include full body paralysis, a nice adaptation that prevents people from jumping out of bed to escape their demons, or otherwise making moves in a dream that could injure them in reality. 
The sleeper awakens from a dream before the paralysis goes away and experiences hallucinations like seeing flashing lights and some kinds of living things lurking around in the bed. I can't read anymore. I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, the only other thing they mention here is with the hallucinations upon wakening from a dream might be interpreted as a visit from a ghost or Satan in newfound land. People have encounters with the old hag, a witch who gets on your bed with you. Hundreds of years ago in Europe, people feared the incubus, an evil spirit that lies on people when they sleep or the succubus, a demon who assumes a female form and has sex with men in their sleep. A lot of this just is just seems like really horny people just coming up with instances of like, <laughs> yeah, man, I got abducted by the sexy aliens, you know, <laughs> I don't know. What do you make of all that, man, before we go on? It's tough. You know, <clears throat> it's really hard to study something like an abduction from the lens of the scientific method. Um, you know, when you ask the question of like, what does science say about these types of things? I mean, there are a few different groups of scientists. Like if you look at the mainstream scientists, like the Neil deGrasse Tysons of the world, they look at this stuff as if it's just fantasy. There's no reason to look into it. It's, you know, it's bullshit, whatever. But there are a lot of really good scientists who are trying to um, collect real data on this stuff. Uh, Avi Loeb is one of them. A-V-I-L-O-E-B, I believe is how you spell his name. Uh, he's a Harvard uh, professor. And I mean, he's doing some really great research on actually trying to find um, materials um, and and like analyze things that have been found to see where the metals originated, if they're from Earth or if they're not. And he's found some really interesting things. There are uh, Gary Nolan is, is another guy who is a very renowned scientist who's looking into trying to find evidence based, um, like factual things, you know, regarding UFOs. So it's really a mixed bag. But in terms of the uh, the phenomenon of abduction, it's so hard. Because, again, you know, I always go back to the consciousness aspect of it. Like, are, is your consciousness being projected or manipulated in a type of way where that's where the abduction is taking place? And if so, how are you supposed to prove that real or not? You know, because if you ask somebody if an experience is real, I mean, was the fear real? Was the, you know, even dreams. Dreams can be analyzed in the same type of way. Uh, if you have a lucid dream, it feels like reality until you wake up. So then what would it mean to wake up out of this reality? Can you wake up out of this reality into another one? Like, can you be projected into a reality that's non-human or something? Like, who knows? So that's the approach I like to take when it comes to abductions. You know, I, I never tell a person that their experience of something is not real, but it's also hard to say that it's tangibly real in terms of the scientific method. You know, not much I can really expand upon with that. I mean, it really does come down to like how we study these things and the evidence that's put forward. And there just hasn't really been anything that's given us like a, a concrete answer on this just yet. Um, but as you mentioned before, and then this is something I want to expand upon, there are a lot of industries, uh, sorry, government related and non non government entities that are doing the work doing the good work trying to trying to explore this because going back to what you said before people who dismiss it and like oh there's just no point studying that blows my mind that a scientist could ever say something like that you know what i'm saying like oh there's no point yeah. studying what i agree it's good to dismiss non-factual information information that's just based on like beliefs and, and doesn't hold any water it doesn't have any facts based on it like fair enough but to not study things at all that just blows my mind like i don't know it just seems very non-scientific a non-scientific thing to say i don't know but whatever we mentioned earlier that there's been like a sort of a, like a rebranding of um ufos to unidentified aerial phenomena now i found that there's an annual report that's conducted by the government under the office of the director of national intelligence this department is known as the odney this department recently coordinated with the all domain anomaly resolution office or aero which is what you mentioned earlier which the department of defense formed last year 
so this report was made in 2022, so it would have been 2021. Um, within the Department, Department of Defense, and they basically formed last year to synchronize all of its various efforts to study past and present reports of anomalous, unidentified space, airborne, submerged, and transmedian objects, which, uh, does that include like boats? And, yeah, under the sea, I well, guess. There's uh, a particular uh, instance that this brings to mind. Uh, one of the people who testified at that hearing I was talking about earlier, his name is Commander David Fravor, and he claimed that he saw this famously now known as the Tic Tac um, object, and he said he saw this thing go under the, under the ocean, like it went into the ocean. So there's very it's very possible i mean think about it we don't know shit about our oceans it's very mm. possible that these things reside in the ocean or something or there's a i've heard another interesting hypothesis that there's like a an a non-human drone manufacturing apparatus under the ocean that spits out like uh like non-human drones to you know do whatever they have to do in terms of like studying us it it would also cool explain one. as well why it's almost impossible to track these aircraft like, let's suppose for a minute that like their base was under the ocean man this is real fucking conspiracy 101 right here but fuck it we're gonna go all the way imagine that was the case so you're in the air you're flying around you've been seen you've been spotted you're being tracked obviously at all times by the airspace now if you go into the ocean you'll be tracked to a degree but then you'll lose contact over the world because obviously we can't go past a certain level like our technology doesn't work. Obviously, humans can't go past that point, but maybe their technology can. Maybe that's how they're always able to escape humans because they have these bases underneath the ocean. They have this infrastructure there. Maybe maybe they've always been there. Maybe, and that would also lend itself to kind of explain why they've been able to track us even thousands of years ago. And we would have just, you know, been like, oh, what are these creatures in the sea? You know, what are these different things? You know, it, it, it kind of connects a lot of different conspiracy theories, which is and it's a fascinating thing. I've never really considered that, man. That's, that, that blows my fucking mind. Um, let's move it forward. Last year, NASA, so that's that's like the authority on everything when it comes to like space travel and stuff, like that's huge, created a 16-member Blue Ribbon UAP study team, which seeks to improve the scientific understanding of UAPs by scouring the space agency's vast archives and assets, as well as civilian and commercial data sources. So I thought this is really interesting. They're taking everything into account for relevant sightings. The team's nine-month unidentified anomalous phenomena independent study, or a mouthful, is well underway. It aims to generate a roadmap of recommendations for potential further NASA UAP studies to follow, as well as a subsequent public report that will detail its findings. Now, this UAP reporting is increasing, enabling a greater awareness of the airspace and increased opportunity to resolve UAP events. In addition to the 144 UAP reports covered during the 17 years of UAP reporting, included in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence Preliminary Assessment, <gasps> there have been 247 new reports and another 119 that were either since discovered or reported after the preliminary assessment times period. This totals, and this is what I wanted to get to, 510 UAP reports as of 30th of August 2022. Now, this is interesting as well, because it sounds like a lot, but it's actually a very small number in comparison with like all of the possible sightings we had. I've mentioned earlier the 80,000 number, which in my notes that I have here, according to New Fork, NU... F-O-R-C, which is like a major agency in the United States, UFO sightings, there's been like 80,000 re records, rec records of UFO sightings between the year 1910 and 2014 in the USA. Now, that's a decade out of date, but that's huge. Like when you think of that, like they've been tracking it that long officially, and there's been that many sightings. UAP events continue to occur in restricted or sensitive airspace, highlighting possible concerns for safety of flight or ad adversary collection activity. And I mean, I I've written this note here, but I think we've already kind of acknowledged this, but I'll just ask anyway. Why do they more commonly occur in these particular airspaces and not everywhere else? Well, 
I think you kind of answered it earlier when you said that like they have a fascination with guns, but do you think there might be any other reasons besides weapons that they might be interested in? It's possible. I mean, I know I like to think of it as even, um, okay. So I'm going to go a little, a little weird here. So say hey. they're extra dimensional. Okay. Say, same as like a human, you know, we cast a shadow onto the ground. You know, so say they're they're trying to to be seen by us. They they might actually be reaching out to us, um, and they're trying to cast their shadow into the third dimension, so to speak. Um, it might not be easy for them to communicate with us. Like say, if you or I wanted to make ourselves known to let's bring up ants again. If I wanted to make myself known to an ant colony, I couldn't speak to that ant, qual uh, that, that ant colony and say, hey, this is me. Like, look at me, I'm a human. I have computers and I have cars and look at all this crazy technology. If I wanted to, to communicate with a lower species, a lower consciousness being, I wouldn't even be able to do it. So it's even possible that they're trying to communicate with us. They're trying to make themselves known. Um, that's one thing I, that, that I like to play with. And, you know, if you are going to try to make yourselves known, Maybe do it uh, in a way where, like, again, with Commander David Fravor, um, it's very interesting. They were conducting a training, a training exercise uh, in the U.S. Air Force, and there, this thing showed up, this Tic Tac showed up, and they chased it. David Fravor, he chased it in his jet, and the thing was gone. He, he, could, not, he could not chase it. Um, and during these training exercises, you know, they, they have... Um, they're called like the LZ or something like the landing zone or like the, the spot where like, if you have your military base and you're conducting your training exercise, where your destination is. So they saw this thing right where they were beginning to, to, to do their, their training exercise. And then it disappeared. It, it was gone. And then when they got to the, to their, their destination zone, it was there waiting for them. So, I mean, who knows what their potential goals are in terms of like of that, but maybe they're just really interested in our level of technological advancement. You know, they want to see our fastest ships and they want to see how, you know, how fast, you know, the, these jets can go or what the, their capabilities are. Maybe they want to see what we would do in a situation where we as humans are armed and we come across them and we think maybe they're a threat. Maybe they want to see if we'll go and attack them because there have been uh, instances where we have shot at them and we've tried to to go after them. So who knows if they're maybe just trying to test, you know, how our reactions are, what we would do, and in terms of like um, if we would freak out if our um, if our first inclination is to engage violently. You know, who knows? Uh, it's so hard to determine you know, what their motivations could possibly be. The Galileo Project. The goal of the Galileo really Project is set to bring the search for extraterrestrial technological signatures of extraterrestrial technological civilizations, ETCs, from accidental or anecdotal observations and legends to the mainstream of transparent, validated and systematic scientific research. This project is complementary to traditional SETI in that it searches for physical objects and not electromagnetic signals associated with extraterrestrial technological equipment. This is all from Harvard, by the way. Last December, uh, this would have been back in 2022. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, no, 2022. So, but it's a 2023 report. Avi Loeb. I think I'm saying that right. Avi Loeb. That's the guy I mentioned earlier. Avi Loeb. Yep. Yeah. Harvard University astrophysicist and head of the Galileo project stated that the project's research team began con like, uh, collecting high quality scientific data with a custom built observatory that was temporarily located on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory. It has since been moved to another location. Assembled at a cost of about $300,000, the observatory can capture continuous video of the sky at infrared optical i wasn't even aware we still use infrared <laughs> optical and radio bends and can record ambient sound as well the plan is to analyze the data with artificial intelligence algorithms now this is interesting bringing ai into the, um 
into of things before making the results available to the scientific community and the general public. Loeb, as a first step, the team has drafted and submitted papers to peer-reviewed journals describing the project's method and goals. The good thing about this as well, uh, on a side note, is that because it's academic, um, the academic world is always fighting trying to find funding from various sources but they don't necessarily need it from the government to continue with their research which i find is brilliant so like anyone that's willing to fund them fund them because that means that this can, research will continue <laughs> we are planning to make three copies of this system over the spring of 2023 and to then place them in desired locations while we continue to test the first system at harvard Loeb says in the coming years we need funding at a level of tens of millions of dollars to get 100 such systems to obtain true statistics on uap there's a couple of quotes um and comments i've left here so <laughs> i had to highlight this the reason that they are ident unidentified is because the u.s government does not possess data of sufficient quality to decipher their nature i love this it's almost like dismissing everything that's ever been because it's like well if the u.s government can't confirm that this is what it is then it's just nonsense and it's like okay it says the only way to advance our knowledge on the nature of uap is through the assembly of high quality data from instruments that are fully cal calibrated and yield reciproducible res results i'll continue the need for rigor goes hand in hand with the wildest notions about the most anomalous observed uaps namely that regardless of their origins they are somehow a product of new physics beyond what defines our scientific understanding of reality this is a really good point sketchy data <laughs> i actually used this and <laughs> sketchy <laughs> sorry just that term i did not expect that in like harvard uh, simply cannot be used to test such a profound possibility, Loeb maintains. The bar on such a discovery is very high and requires a demonstration that conventional interpretations fail. He says, only the highest quality data could remove reasonable doubts. And I sort of commented on this. So we don't have the necessary tools to measure what we don't understand. Therefore, we have to test whether those tools are in fact reliable or not. It's like... We don't understand what we don't understand, almost. <laughs> That's what I'm getting from this. We need better tools. There's also some independent groups. I wanted to cover this as well, just bring this in here, that are unrelated to the government, which I find this interesting. So there's one called UAPX, which is a Florida-based nonprofit organization dedicated to the scientific study of UAPs. Its team includes physicists, engineers, and other specialists. And like the Galileo project, it deploys customized sensor-laden gear in its quest for more data. UAP instruments include infrared, vi visible, sorry, and ultraviolet cameras and spectrographs. In July 2021, UAP X team members tracked their sensors to the Catalina Channel, a purported UAP hotspot off the coast of California. Data gathered during the five-day outing revealed potential anomalous activity, which is just a whole lot of nothing. UAPX team members say, but the group has not yet released its full results. Matthew Sizidagis, I'm going to guess that's how you say his name. I'm sorry if I butchered that. A UAPX team member and associate professor in physics at the University of Albany, State University of New York, categorizes the problem with UAP study as a lack of cohesion. All organizations, be they governmental, military, scientists, civilian, have their own reporting methods and standards, and those taking their own data all use different technologies, he observes. How is anyone supposed to make headway against such a hodgepodge <laughs> with QAPX? Our solution is to only look at our own data, Sizzy Diggis says. Countless other non-governmental organizations look at witness reports and other data, making UAPX's mission, mission a complementary one in nature. Why? Because they're just ignoring everyone else. They're just only using their data, so that makes them separate. <laughs> Another final example, Enigma Labs. Another data-driven approach from Enigma Labs, a private company based in New York City that is developing a mobile platform for crowdsourcing UAP reports. I found this fascinating. The company's newly launched smartphone app, there's always a bloody smartphone app, offers both a repository for some 270,000 historic sightings from the past century. These numbers just keep flying. And ways for users to record, upload, and rate new ones. 
dodgy though that you anyone can potentially upload this each observation is subject to an enigma score a one through 100 rating that's dependent on a variety of factors such as the number and distribution of witnesses as well as the notional quality of the collected data by ingesting hundreds of thousands of sightings reported in every country and learning from historical sightings we've been able to build a standardized reporting model that will make sightings comparable queryable and accessible across the world says mark douglas chief operating officer of enigma labs one of the com company's most important objectives douglas says is to educate the public around what uap are not highlighting in terms of cases of mistaken identity where observers were flummoxed by balloon toting lanterns overflying sat satellites falling space debris even pyrotechnic wearing skydivers showboats in their aerial aerobatics. That way we are hopefully improving the quality of reporting overall, he concludes. Okay, a few things I, I just want to kind of like delve into here. Um, I think it's noteworthy that they're trying to improve their methods for how they're investigating these things. I think that's brilliant. Um, it's interesting the different types of technology, and I'm really intrigued by how they're going to use AI to introduce that to the reporting element. Any thoughts or opinions on this, Josh, as far as like how the studies and in investigations into UFOs are now developing, and of course how technology is is sort of rapidly changing in that sort of area? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think the Galileo project is really on the right track here. Um, recently, they had put out. Um, their findings on, they, they found pieces of metal, like little spherical pieces of metal in the Pacific Ocean. And they're able to uh, identify that the structure, like the molecular structure of the metals is uh, like non-Earth. Like it didn't originate from Earth. So that means that it could possibly have come from a meteor. It could have come from non-human intelligence. It, it could come from anywhere. But that's the type of research that I think needs to be done, um, especially in the scientific community, because those are things that you can actually look at, identify, and say, okay, this is an anomaly here. This doesn't belong, um, because it's really difficult. I understand a lot of these these organizations, like you said, the one that, that puts out the smartphone app where it wants people to film stuff, and, and we want to have this database of, of sightings. Like, it's just difficult. It's very, very hard to make any conclusive statements based off of anecdotal evidence and based off something that you can't actually prove. You know, that's why I, I do think the Galileo Project, Avi Loeb, and some of these other guys who are trying to like really pinpoint the science uh, and identifying what is from here and what is not from here is a good way to start. And maybe if there are, you know, back engineered UFOs and crafts that you know these these contracting companies have maybe it would be a good idea to share that with mainstream science so that we can figure out you know from there what to do you know how to maybe research uh, their ability to travel so fast without uh, any sort of heat signature because the real implications here in terms of the people that are just living daily lives and don't really care too much about aliens and UFOs are the potential for widespread technological advancement advancement for us you know imagine what it could mean to revolutionize how we consume energy how we distribute energy um, to completely revolutionize travel there's just so many technological implications to what we could figure out here that could just benefit the whole world and could you know um, potentially eradicate a lot of the widespread um, issues that we're seeing, you know, across third world countries and even across our own homelessness and, you know, the inability to, you know, just acquire basic goods um, because of a capitalistic system that has just shit all over its people. You know, the all of this stuff could be completely reformed with, you know, free energy and radical advancement in, in our technology. I think that's really where it's going to affect people the most. Couldn't agree more. Let's talk whistleblowers real quick. I got this information from the Scientific American. This is a specific article. According to Leslie Keane, 
a veteran investigative reporter who has spent decades covering UFOs and UAPs. The most important near-term progress on the topic is likely to come out of Capitol Hill rather than any science lab or smartphone app. The next year and a half should be a heady time for UAP revelations, she says, thanks to the National Defense Authorization Act fiscal year 2023. Amongst other things, that act includes arrangements for a better, more secure process for whistleblowers to come forward. Now, you touched on this earlier. I just want to kind of expand on it a bit. This process has already begun, Keane says, with some whistleblowers having met congressional staff and or members of Aero. Those who've signed secrecy agreements related to UAP are now free to reveal that previously protected information to Aero and to Congress without fear of retribution or prosecution, Keane explains. Congressional committees could then make an effort to verify the information provided by the whistleblowers, some of which may concern the recovery of materials from crashed UFOs and involve legacy investigative programs going back decades. Keen foresees, of course, we don't know how much of the information provided will be made public. She adds, some of it may have national security implications and will have to be withheld. But ideally, the new process will bring more valuable UAP data to light and help validate earlier reports from reputable eyewitnesses who already came forward. Now, there's a push for these whistleblowers. But I don't know if they can really guarantee people's secrecy. Uh, sorry, uh, security, really. I, You know, famously, when people have spoken out on these things, um, people have disappeared. Never heard from those people again. Dodgy things happen. We've heard about the uh, the men in black suits in regards to UFOs and, and phenomena. Um, do you think they're really legitimately trying to protect people here and and get information or is this just a way of getting people to be like hey trust us everything's okay come give us your story and then see you later i think that it's legitimate and the reason i say that is because i go back to the the two facets of government that are involved here the our elected officials who are out of the loop and then the dark secret government people who are in the loop um, our elected officials, the people that we elect in office that we trust to allocate our tax dollars, they're left out of this. They're, they're just as uh, out, of, out of the loop as, as we are. So I think they are making a concerted effort because think about it. If you're an elected official and you should have oversight of these programs and you find out that you don't, you find out that you're not even able to, to get information on them and there is – zero congressional oversight for what these people can do in these programs. I, I mean, if I was a congressman, I'd be pissed and I would want to get to the bottom of it. And I think they are. I think we have what we're seeing here in this disclosure movement is you're seeing our elected officials versus the dark shadow governments. And right now they, they seem to be at a head. Um, I don't know in terms of, uh, the safety of the whistleblowers, I really hope that the government will do whatever they can, but they can't prevent smear campaigns. And mm. right now, that guy, David Grush, that I had brought up before, there's a small smear campaign that's sort of taking place right now against him. Um, so they're going to try to question the credibility of some of these people. But I mean, already there's a huge, huge number of whistleblowers that have come forward and have had meetings with Congress and with other people. Uh, the one that was on TV and that was widespread, that was a that was just the one instance. There were three guys, but there have been countless people who are coming forward within these programs. So I think Leslie Keen is right. She is a great journalist, and she's been on this, this topic for a while. Um, I do think that we are going to get a very important piece of this disclosure from our, our elected officials, which is weird because I never thought I'd ever say that. I don't trust these people at all, but... It's crazy, man. You know, our the United States government is so, so divided, so divided on, on everything. If you look at, I've watched a few congressional hearings on different topics. Um, one of the ones I watched recently was the Twitter files. That was interesting because you see the, the, the Congress people that are on the left and the Congress people on the right, Republican and Democrat, they're just fighting the whole time you there there there's there's one group of people who are on the side of the whistleblowers and one group that's not and it's so obvious but in the ufo congressional hearings you 
could not tell whether or not each of these people were Democrat or Republican. Every one of them, they were asking really good questions. There was no division at all. So to me, that's a really, really good sign. I mean, you have, you know, Tim Burchett, who is like a Republican, and then you have uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who, who couldn't be more to the left. And these two people are both asking genuine, legitimate questions, trying to get to the bottom of an issue and not bringing their politics into it at all. So to me, that's a beautiful thing. I've never seen that before, and it's a good sign. Yeah, I mean, that stating the obvious but i mean it's a it's a issue that we have to kind of be united on because it's we need a unified response to it really i mean if if look, if if aliens came down tomorrow we would need a unified response as far as like how to react to that we can't be quibbling squabbling sorry amongst ourselves we need to decide together so yeah i, c I couldn't agree more a uh, couple of like final questions here, which blew my mind. I think they're brilliant. Thank you so much, Bilma. You are amazing. A couple of final questions. Here we go. What is the role of popular culture in shaping beliefs and perceptions about UFOs? I thought this was a fantastic question because, and before I let you answer, Josh, I'll just give my quick opinion on this. I think that the role initially was to just, bank on it, have fun with it, make money out of it. You know, we mentioned earlier about like, it's true. You go to Las Vegas, there's like a million different like alien theme shops and hotels and merchandise and, you know, like TV shows like the X-Files, whatever. Like it's, there's so much out there uh, and still to this day. But now we've moved past that and we're getting to a point where it's being taken a bit more seriously. And I think that, a big reason for that is that technology has shifted. And I know we've touched on that before earlier, but now it's more verifiable. Now we it's no longer, oh, what's that random thing in the in the sky? Uh, but I have no way or idea of like, identifying what that is. Now we can do things like send a drone up. We can uh, get image processing of it from from like miles and miles away there's so much and there's ways to record stuff and there's just stuff that just didn't exist say like 40 50 years ago and i think that naturally that is going to shift public perception and also look i mean it's being acknowledged instead of the government always just saying like nah this is nonsense now nah, forget it forget it forget it now they're setting up organizations to study this there's unified efforts across the world there's independent bodies studying this information Basically, I feel the, to answer the question, what is the role of popular culture now? Well, I think it's more about kind of maybe lending some legitimacy to this, maybe trying to make people realize, hey, it's no longer just a bit of sci-fi fun. Now, maybe it's a real thing that, you know, we're headed for. But pose the question to you, Josh, what is the role of popular culture in shaping beliefs and perceptions about UFOs? I think a big role is we need to push our elected officials and push our public servants uh, to get to the bottom of this in a responsible way. Um, you know, public perception can be swayed. It can be influenced in so many different ways. Um, and we've seen that throughout, you know, the 50, 60 years of propaganda that's been pushed on us um, by movies, by TV, by news, by, you know, um, um, what are they called? Tabloids. Oh my <laughs> gosh, the tabloids. I think I discovered this recently. I think it was the Inquirer, one of the one of the really popular tabloids. The the very first tabloids in America were created because of the UFO phenomenon. They were created to make to make light of, uh, I believe it was the Roswell crash, so that the public their perception would be altered in a way that would adhere to the propaganda as opposed to questioning what actually happened. Um, and adhering to the initial reports that it was a flying saucer that crashed. So public perception, very interesting because we are very moldable people. Um, we can be led to believe almost anything, but I think it's imperative that as a public, we responsibly do our own research, not get caught into too many conspiracies, but to do our research, to find the evidence and to push our scientists, our government, our people in power to, uh, not only research this but also disclose the information to us because we we deserve it you know this this country your country any democratic nation is run 
by its people. We are the ones who keep this place going. Uh, if it wasn't for us, who would take the, the, the trash out? You know, who would detail the cars? Who would sell the whatevers? You know, who would, you know, process all the orders? You know, we, we as people, we run this shit and we deserve to know what's going on behind the scenes. And I think it's our, it's our responsibility to push our elected officials to disclose this information to us, or at least disclose the information to us that's not detrimental to the Department of Defense. Because I could definitely see a situation, maybe some things that we shouldn't you know, say to the public, because mm -hmm. of course other countries are gonna try to weaponize it, and there's definitely circumstances where we don't want to share too much of the technology. So I, I, I do get that. But. It's the widespread panic thing that we covered earlier, isn't it? Like you just don't want to panic people. Maybe, maybe there is stuff that is really concerning about this alien technology or alien life that we that the government knows, and they're just thinking like, if we tell people, I mean, this is really bad. Like people won't react well to this, and it could ruin everything. Like I think if that is true. Maybe it is better to at least keep it under wraps for now. This question is absolutely incredible. And I don't even know that we've even touched this, but yeah, I've definitely had conversations with various family members about stuff like this. <laughs> Since, thank you, Vilma, again, for this, this final question. Since watching the film Prometheus, where it is shown that humans are probably so different from all of the species on Earth because their DNA contains a strain of alien DNA, this theory kind of stayed with me and sort of made sense in my head. I mean, we share almost 99% identical DNA as apes. I think it's a little bit less, maybe like 97, but yeah, thereabouts. What about this 1% or say 3%? Why are we only the only species on this planet that can talk and build wonderful things and civilizations, but also destroy each other and our planet in terrible and brutal ways? What do you guys think about this theory of human DNA containing other alien DNA? Okay, there's two things in this I want to address right off the bat. Before we get into that, because that's huge. That first question, why are we the only species on this planet that can talk and build things? That fascinates me. Why is that? Have there not been others? Why is it only us? Why is it that, that like in the animal kingdom, like they say that dolphins are supposed to be like super, super intelligent, right? Okay, great. But why haven't they evolved like us? You know, I know they're sea based. I know people are going to call me out and be like, oh, you're an idiot. But like, no, but let's just look at that for a second. Like, we've evolved. We evolved from um, something more primitive to the point where we are now, right? And we'll evolve again in the future. And I look at animals and you, know, you could argue maybe it's just because we're the dominant species and that's the only reason. But I don't think it's completely implausible to think that you know other species could have developed to the same point as us and, and developed their own mini civilizations or, or challenging or even better than us. You know, um, let's let's explore that for a second. Why do you think that's not happened, man? <laughs> Vilma, thank you for these questions. They're fantastic. Um, this is so interesting. Now, man, there are so many different ways that evolution can can track, but we are obviously very different. I mean, we we manipulate our environment in the weirdest way. I mean, look at what we're doing right now. We're interfacing across the world, you know what I mean, through electronics. There's there's something to be said about the the intelligence of dolphins and orcas and all of this. I like to look at dolphins and orcas and things that are really super intelligent in nature as very wise. I think that on the scale of wisdom versus intelligence, I think humans are very, very intelligent, maybe not so wise. Um, so I think we do have something, something to learn from the orcas and from the dolphins in terms of wisdom, how to symbiotically live with the earth instead of destroying it. Um, how to live with each other in packs instead of destroying each other. There are many things to learn um, and that I think they have a leg up on um, in terms of wisdom, but we are just so different. We are so different. We have culture, we have art, we do very, very strange things. Um, and then like, I don't know if you want to segue into the second part of that question, yeah, but I think the it. second part of that that question can answer the first part. Um, it is very possible that we can that we have been our DNA has been altered by some alien race. This is like super duper like deep conspiracy, but yep. 
there, I mean, this also goes toward ancient cultures as well. There are ancient texts, ancient cave art, and ancient art all over the place um, that claim there were, were gods that ascended from, you know, the cosmos, came down and either altered our genetics in some way or altered the evolution of our consciousness in some way. And I mean, it, the more and more I think about it and the more research I do on it, it, it almost seems plausible to me because we are that different. We are just such an anomaly on this planet. Yeah. I, I, I think for me personally, I always look at the fact that like, there's so many unanswered questions and so much we don't know. And yeah, tying into that, that first part of the question, it would make a lot of sense that there was some intervention of some description or certainly like a, something that sped things up. It's not to say that we couldn't have ever necessarily got to that point, but it blows my mind. I mean, especially when you look at other simian varieties on earth that haven't evolved to that point. Now you can make the argument that, okay, they're being held back by us even, but even in nature, the ones that aren't, actively being held in captivity why have they not advanced to the same level we have maybe it just takes many many years or maybe it's because we've got that like leg up so to speak from a kind of scientific perspective like we there was some intervention i don't know it's not impossible but it's one of those things that there, there, there doesn't seem to be like cold hard evidence for but it when we talk about the specifics as far as like the the datum, the, the makeup of, of the DNA, th there's some unanswered questions there that need some explaining. What's going on there? Don't know what's going on there. Very interesting stuff, man. This whole show has been absolutely incredible, and I think that we've outdone ourselves on this one. Um, I knew that you'd come prepared, and I knew I needed to step up my A game. And do you know what? I've learned, I've learned a lot through, through doing this. Um... I think I learned a lot about just like not just the topic at hand, but also just the the nature of doing deep dives and like how to approach it and such, you know, because you've got like your own opinion, the scientific opinions, the opinions of the masses, you've got everything. And like UFOs, like as I mentioned at the beginning of this, it's the tip of the iceberg. We've we've only given you a very, very brief kind of let's say I, I called this introduction to to ufos and aliens and i think that's a very i think it is a, a very good introduction to those things but it is by no means comprehensive there's so much out there so many different angles and that's ironic because you know it's kind of like how we are with our understanding of aliens and ufos there's so much we don't understand there's so much we don't know maybe we'll come to know that in the future but here we are with this introduction and i think that it couldn't have been done without yourself josh so thank you so much for all your hard work and and your time and dedication here thank you so much to vilma as well for for just all the wonderful questions and for everyone who who is invested in what we're doing um to me and to me and josh like podcasting and, and creating these shows means a lot i think if, if you Forgive me for, for speaking on behalf of you, but uh, you know, there are, the reality is, and we said this both off camera, but I want to cover it here. The reality is there are so many shows out there. So many shows, good shows as well. Not just, not just the crappy ones, which is what I'm implying, but there are a lot of good shows out there too. And we're all fighting to try and be heard ironically. And. I think we'll always continue doing what we do. And I, I love shows like this where it kind of reminds me why I started doing this in the first place. And I know I've said this to you before, but I'll say it again. I absolutely love speaking with you, Josh. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, man. Couldn't have done it without you. Thank you so much, man. Your your episodes are always fantastic. You you always come so prepared. I know that every time you approach me with a topic or I come to you, it's you know, we're gonna have a great conversation. I just really appreciate it, man. And thank you, Vilma, again, as you said, for the amazing questions. It's just, it's such a ride, man. And, you know, we met through through this, you know, yeah. and now we continue to have hour long com hours and hour long conversations together, you know, just trying to figure stuff out. You know, uh, we may not be the, the most successful podcasters in the whole world, but 
man, we are learning so much and making connections and that's what matters, man. Couldn't be more right. Thank you so much, man. And uh, yeah, to all the listeners of the Christian Marie podcast, as always, be safe, be well. I hope that you'll consider leaving us a review on Podchaser or Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to this podcast. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Christian Reeve for exclusive bonus podcast content and other types of content. Come join the Discord community. Make sure you go out of your way to check out the Pursuit of Infinity podcast. Josh's show is absolutely incredible and you're you're just sleeping if you're not listening to it. It's bloody brilliant. Go check it out. And uh, yeah, most importantly, be safe, be well, and remember, we're not alone in the universe. Goodbye.